Kuecho. The President, please be seated. The court is now back in session. We'd like now to hand over to counsel for Mr. Kilson Pond to continue putting questions to the expert. Thank you, Mr. President. This uh, is the last lap in this race. Uh, before I move on uh, to the next uh, section of one of the documents I presented to you yesterday, I would like to backtrack a little bit following your answer in which you said that it was Long Dorin who allegedly spoke to you about meetings with Kyusson Pan or meetings during which Kyusson Pan uh, spoke and during the break we checked this and Long Dorin did say before this chamber and I will um, and for the record I will say, as well as for your comments, I'd like to refer to an excerpt of uh, his statement. This was on 8 December 2011. This is E1 slash uh, uh, 19.1 French ERN 00761359 Khmer ERN 00 Seven five nine one nine seven English ERN zero zero seven six one two six four and in this record this is the question that is put to Long Doreen. In French it's on line twenty two. Did you attend meetings in which Nunchia or Kyosampan were present? And the answer not Nunchia. And I also did not uh, attend any meetings which Que Saint-Pont would have attended. So this is what Longdorin said before this chamber. So my question is, are you sure that it is Longdorin who spoke to you about this meeting? Or you don't remember? Or maybe it was somebody else? Or maybe the source is not uh, reliable? Uh, there's room for misunderstanding on, on such things. Whether Long Narin thought you were asking uh, uh, about um, uh, a, a meeting of officials to discuss official matters, uh, and in that case, certainly he would not. He would not have been present at which um, uh, either uh, Nguyen Chair or uh, uh, Q Sampan uh, set out policy decisions that he was not present at any meeting at which Q Sampan uh, conducted a seminar or a study session. My recollection is that he said he was, but I, 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 I would not go further than that. And on, on, this, on this subject, you did, you did say, um, uh, when we discussed this earlier, uh, that uh, I, I was not sure where such meetings would have taken place. Um, I didn't. I have certainly didn't ask about the specifics of that meeting, but all such meetings for foreign ministry personnel took place in the foreign ministry. Uh, to leave the foreign ministry at that time for officials required special authorization, and there had to be a, a special purpose. So I, I, the meetings I was referring to would certainly have taken place in the foreign ministry. Okay, so some also these are your recollections, okay? And I wanted to tender this uh, statement to, to you for things to be clear. Now I'm going to move on to another document uh, which uh, you normally have had the time to become aware of in a document that's rather long. But first of all, I'd like to refer to a segment uh, from your book 
And in the English version, it's on page 356. The French ERN uh, is 00639 922. And the English ERN is 00396 564. It's at the middle of the page. It's uh, an excerpt in which you speak about uh, the border problems between Cambodia and Vietnam. And you say the following. In May 1976, Cambodian and Vietnamese negotiators held talks in Phnom Penh to try to reach agreement on delineating their common border. The meetings were intended to pave the way for a summit in Hanoi to sign a border treaty. So this I read to you is to, in order to put my questions in context. Uh, so you speak about a meeting that took place in May 1976, and I'd like to refer you to document E3-221. French ERN uh, 0038617. English uh, 0018-2693. And Khmer 0000-0001. And the document is titled Examination of the Reaction of Vietnam During the Fifth Meeting on the Morning of 14 May 1976. And it is also indicated that there was a standing committee meeting on the afternoon and in the evening of that day. The participants, Comrade Secretary, Comrade Deputy Secretary, Comrade Van, Comrade Vaughan, Comrade Kyu, Comrade Hem, Comrade Ya, Comrade Chan, Comrade Se, Comrade Tuik, Recorder. And the first paragraph is entitled Report of uh, the Situation in the Fifth Meeting. And in this record, contrary to other records uh, that uh, we might have from the Standing Committee, this record is very detailed and it's stated very much in detail who is speaking and who is saying what. And this is Comrade Ya speaking, uh, reported to the meeting. And this is what he says. Fan Yen expressed an opinion reading a typed text of many pages. They thanked us for the visit to Angkor and were impressed with our organization. They said that they had considered our opinions about the visit and about the stance of negotiation. They said that some opinions were the same, some different. There were some opinions on which there was no mutual understanding. Two paragraphs further, in this record again, Karmat Ya continues, regarding the sea borders, they said they had examined our opinions on the 5th and on the 8th, but they take their stance firmly that we had accepted their three conditions, or 3B, in that, uh, in, I don't know what this corresponds to exactly. However, later we based ourselves on the Brevier line uh, in order to mark the border. We said that this line was undeniable. And on the following page in French, ERN 00386-176, English 00182-694. Khmer, 00, 00, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 8, 11, 11. In s I'm, I'm skipping a paragraph here. 
In summary, they did not acknowledge the Brevia line. They said that legally the Brevia line had no basis at all. They said that if the Brevia line was taken, this would have an impact uh, on their national sovereignty, and that was unacceptable. This is what is stated at the beginning of this document. So my question in order to put things back in context is, first of all, in this uh, account, are uh, meetings referred to uh, th uh, that uh, you referred to uh, in your book? And if such is the case, can you tell us what the Brevier line was and what the problem was? The Brevier line was the line uh, dividing the sea border between Vietnam uh, the former French colony of, of, of uh, Cochin, China, and Cambodia. And the uh, Cambodians, the DK, wished to make that the basis for the sea border uh, because it had always been so. Uh, all the borders, as they point out in this document, had been drawn by the French. And uh, the Vietnamese wanted to shift the sea border quite dramatically to give a much larger sea area to Vietnam. Uh, if we read the document, what is interesting to me is that uh, there is a very obvious and strong willingness on the DK side to prevent this becoming a real uh, apple of discord. In other words, if we can't agree on, on it, let us drag out the negotiations. Uh, let, us, let us try and, and uh, basically keep things calm. At one point, Pol Pot says, in the past, we've had many disagreements. We've always managed to overcome them. So the line on the Cambodian side was essentially conciliatory. I should have asked, started by asking you, were you aware of this document before? I think I have seen a Vietnamese summary of it, but I have not seen the original Khmer document. With respect to the conciliatory approach that you've just mentioned, I'd like to look at the very end of the same document. It's 00386191 in French. In English, 00182704. And in Khmer, five zeros, eight two six. The conclusions seem to be Comrade Nuon says, as I say it, Ledouan himself wrote that he wanted to meet us twice. Both of his telegrams stated that he really needs us. Comrade Secretary, so we act gentle. We go watch their movie. They do not yet have any reason to break off from us because we will keep smiling and have never cursed them. If they break it off, they gain nothing. They only lose. And I think that it is in respect of that that you were saying that there was very much a conciliatory stance on the part of the Cambodians. Not only that, uh, all the way through this rather do long document, that is the case. And uh, I, I mentioned in my books that there, there are other statements which uh, confirmed they, they uh, did not wish to, uh, tension to escalate uh, over this issue. Uh, sur, uh, la On the... Well, the relationships degenerated over the longer term. Uh, we had a witness who was saying that he had 
fought at the frontier and the pro border problems were certainly recurrent ones throughout the regime period. Am I correct there? Yes, and there was fault on both sides on the land border. Uh, I, I think it can be well established that there were Cambodian DK troops incursions into Vietnam, uh, and certainly there were Vietnamese incursions into Cambodia. Might I just add one remark uh, apropos of this document, because I think it is significant. Um, Ms. Q. Song Pong attended this meeting, but did not speak, according to the minutes. And uh, the, all the others, uh, except for the recorder, um, did speak. And I think that is fairly consistent with other standing committee meeting, uh, minutes of, of meetings, uh, unless it were a subject in, in, for which he had specific responsibility he did not speak on other subjects, whereas uh, Nguyen Chia, of, of course, and Pol Pot uh, did, um, which fits in with what I, what I have been suggesting at other times in this hearing, that Mr. Q. Sompom was not part of the decision-making core. He was present at these standing committee meetings, but he, his role was not the same as that of Nguyen Chia, uh, or the other major participants. Well, I think you have jumped the gun there on my next question, so I'll go to another point. So, over the last few days, we have talked a great deal, and you mentioned this more than once with my colleague from the non chair team, about different levels of treatment between different zones. And we've talked about the different backgrounds of the zone leaders. Yesterday, the expression warlords came up when my colleague was questioning you, and you said that Kyosampa himself had used the term uh, in saying that many problems arose from that source. And you said that if it was his position, it wasn't necessarily yours. To shed light on this point, I would like to read from your book. On page 281, the French ERN is 0639817. And in English, 0039649. I want to read the entire passage. It's at the bottom in the French, in the middle of the penultimate paragraph. And you say that six of the principal zone leaders, Rosnim and Kong Sopal in the northwest, Pauk in the north, Nesaran in the northeast, Saupem in the east, and Mok in the southwest, and you mentioned that this was not fortuitous, had started their revolution to Korea's as Israelites during the war against the French. They showed the same extreme single-mindedness the same excessive simplification, the same ruthlessness and contempt for human life as the rebels of 30 years earlier. They also showed the same fractiousness and diversity. Unlike orthodox communist states, where decision-making is highly centralized, 
and implementation is, in theory, monolithic, Khmer Rouge Cambodia was unruly. That combination of attributes would prove one of the most enduring features of Pol's regime and eventually a prime cause of its downfall. Yesterday, during our exchanges, I understood that when you were talking about disparity in treatment, lack of discipline among the Khmer Rouge when Phnom Penh was being evacuated, I understood that you were limiting the problem to that particular period, saying that after, later on, there was a degree of unification of things and they were, so to speak, streamlined. And this morning, when you were talking with my learned colleague, I also understood you to be saying that it was quite impossible not to respect the discipline. Now, in the extract that I've just read out, it seems to me that there was a discipline problem that wasn't limited to the evacuation stage, but which continued beyond that. And indeed, that you believe that it is one of the major causes of the fall of the regime. Can you enlighten us about what I seem to have understood from what you were saying uh, on previous days and what you wrote in this section of your book? Thank you. When we were speaking earlier, uh, it was in the context of the, the victory in Phnom Penh and the immediate aftermath. But uh, that was not a one-off aberration. Uh, it was the situation before that, indeed, at the very beginning, uh, the very beginning of the guerrilla war in 1968, the early 70s, it was even more difficult to impose any kind of harmony because of the difficulties in communication. By the mid-70s, I'm talking 73, 74, communications improved, and it was easier for the center to lay down its line. But still, uh, the, the central line was conveyed to the zone leaders uh, who would interpret it in, after their own fashion. And that remained the case uh, after, uh, after April 1975 throughout the DK period. There, was, there were considerable variations and great difficulty in harmonizing uh, a policy throughout the country. I, I've used the term a, a general consensus because if you look at Khmer Rouge policy in the various different areas, uh, there were uh, many things in common. There was a basis which everybody adhered to. But beyond that basis, there was great variation. Uh, that happens with most communist systems. It happened to a much, much lesser degree a very small degree in China, almost not at all in the Soviet Union. But it does happen everywhere, and it happened to a, 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 a very considerable extent in DK. But in this extract that I read out, the impression I have is that unlike the orthodox communist states where decision-making is highly centralized and implementation is in theory monolithic. Khmer Rouge, Cambodia was unruly. Now when I read that, it seems to me that you are setting Cambodia on one side as an exception from the orthodox communist states that you're acquainted with elsewhere. I understand that there are similarities, but it seems to me that you're drawing our attention in this passage to the exceptional nature of the DK case. I may have misunderstood, or are there other nuances that I have missed? Uh, 
I think it's fair enough to say that DK was exceptional in many regards, and that was one of them. It, there was a degree of unruliness which you did not find in what I've chosen to call orthodox Marxist-Leninist countries. Yesterday, when we were talking about hunger as an instrument of pressure and power, you said that in your understanding, Pol Pot did not intend to starve people. He wanted people to be healthy with enough to eat for the development of the country. On the other hand, at the local level, it was used as a means of exerting pressure. Can I deduce, and you will correct me if I am wrong, that in such conditions it's rather difficult to say that there is a CPK policy to wish to starve the population. Uh, I would merely repeat that there was no C CKP, <laughs> CPK policy to starve the population. There, there simply was no such policy. Uh, the policy was that uh, the, they, Cambodia wanted as big a population as possible, and indeed uh, the forced marriages, uh, the, the insistence at the grassroots that couples who had married should produce children, all that was to try to make the population bigger so that Cambodia would become stronger and its production greater. The, it's, all that is wholly consistent. The, the problem arises when uh, v illiterate, uh, very often illiterate, uneducated uh, low-level officials with few resources except fear uh, have to force a, a large population under their control to go out and work very long hours. Uh, the, the many problems arose, but in practice, therefore, in the end, hunger was used as a weapon uh, to, to exert control at the grassroots. So there's a contradiction. Continuing with this question of the opposition there may be between the directive giving center and opposition at the local level. I'd like to read an extract from a witness statement who testified in this chamber. His name is Mivun. Let me pause a while while I find the document. It is the transcript of the 4th of October 2012, E1 stroke 13041. ERN in French. Zero zero eight five three four five five in English zero zero eight five three three four three zero zero eight five one one five one in Khmer zero zero eight five one one five one that's the Khmer.
The background to this is that there was a witness who was a soldier and who says that he was summoned by Pol Pot for a meeting at Wat Un Alum and he was given instructions at that juncture. And he tells what Pol Pot was explaining to him then. So the question is, during the meeting, did you receive any instructions on your transfer to Preya Vihar? And he says, before I left for Preya Vihar, I heard word about what was going on in the East Zone. And in August, I was asked about the Preya Vihar situation because there people had been arrested. And there were people who were starving. In Siem Reap, the situation was similar. People had been put in prison in that place. Question, what were you told to do in prayer over here, and why did you have to go there? Answer, first, he asked, Tassong, that's the superior of the witness, to report on the imprisonment of certain individuals. My task in the province of Preve here was to look at the question of the arrest and imprisonment of certain people to see if it had actually happened. In addition to that, I was told to deal with dispatching some merchandise to Preve here and to check that they had reached their destination. So in that testimony extract, well, you can draw whatever conclusions you want from it, but according to Mr. Mivun's statement here, Pol Pot was asking him to go out to a region because he had heard that certain things were happening there and he wanted to know what the situation was. Does this example not shed light on what we were saying about the disparities between zones and regions and the fact that it was not always easy for the center to maintain control over what was going on. I, I don't think it shows, with respect, I don't think it shows disparities. Uh, I think it simply shows uh, a, a, a desire on the part of of the central leadership to know what was happening in the zones. Now, you can say that shows um, a lack of faith in the orthodox communication channels because uh, he could have asked the zone leadership to report to him. Um, but I, I don't think it's unusual that a leader uh, would send a, an, a mission to investigate it's a little bit like what we were talking about Kusan Pon earlier when he was sent on delicate missions to find out what was happening in the provinces. This seems to have been a, a practice of Pol Pot's. Uh, Mr. Short, if I'm not mistaken, when we talked about sensitive missions and travel to the provinces, you didn't quote any particular example to me, and it was more an assumption on your part. No, it wasn't an assumption. It was, it was uh, I went as far as I could uh, in characterizing that. Uh, when Pol Pot was in Ratanakiri, he sent his wife, Q Ponnery, who was then in, in good health, on investigation missions to other provinces. So th this was, this was a, a, a way of operating that goes back quite far. And you know which province Kyosampan went to at Pol Pot's bidding? And who gave you that information? I think we discussed this this morning, and I gave you my source, who was uh, Swang Sikun. Uh, I certainly discussed it with uh, Pipun. I cannot recollect, uh, let me say again, 
exactly what he said, and uh, the, the matter of uh, Q. Song Pon reporting back is in Dirk's, Dirk's te testimony. So those were the sources for that. So you're speaking about uh, Duke's testimony that you heard. You heard the audio recording of this, of this testament. Is that what you're speaking about? I misused the word testimony. I said that, explained this morning that Dirk had given a number of interviews before his arrest, which formed the basis for a book which was published. Uh, and I had access to the transcripts, the complete transcripts of those interviews. Now, that is the source, my source, for saying that he spoke about this matter. Okay. Fine. I am almost done with my questioning, so rest assured, because Kong Samun, my colleague, will also have a few questions to put to you. Now I would like to turn to public uh, declarations you made um, regarding democratic Kampuchea. I believe that you were also given two articles uh, in the folder, one article that is rather old, dated from the Phnom Penh Post 9 slash 23 from 10 to the from 23rd of November 2000 and the ERN of this document is 00 842-099. And the document is E226-1.1.1. And in this interview, oh, sorry, it's not an interview, uh, in this article entitled The Devil's Advocate, there should be no trial against the Khmer Rouge. Let me just read out an excerpt. English CRN. Uh, English CRN is 00839-9. And this is what you say. This is a long article, so I'm just going to read out a passage, and I will ask you to comment. Free translation. An international court created to prosecute the former Khmer Rouge leader will have nothing to do with justice. Its only mission will be to exercise judicial vengeance to satisfy uh, the interests of UN bureaucracy and to appease the political discomfort of the United States. So my first question here, and maybe this is a, a harsh position you state here, but so under which conditions did you write uh, this uh, column and why? The President, Mr. Expert, please hold on. Mr. Prosecutor, you may proceed. Your Honours, I have to say it's disappointing given the defence's request for extra time to see them going into these completely extraneous matters. Um, with utmost respect for Mr. Short's expertise and, and uh, years of experience, uh, this is neither a matter that is within the scope of, of this trial, um, nor is it a matter on which his expert opinion can assist Your Honours. Um, this is completely irrelevant. The question should not be allowed, uh, and my learned friend should be uh, required to m move on to relevant matters, keeping in mind her request for extra time. Well, Mr. President, I'd like to answer this quickly. I'd like to remind 
you that this is a document that we asked to place on the case file when for Mr. Short's testimony. I don't have the number of uh, this request, but I can find it. And this request was granted, which means that today, once again, uh, it is important to remind that Mr. Short is not an ordinary witness. He came as an expert, and therefore we can ask him, indeed, for his opinion, and this is what we have been doing over the past four days. So I believe that he, we're speaking, we're dealing with a very important point here, and it's important in your assessment of his testimony to understand his opinion, and that you can be clear about his stance regarding uh, this trial, in which he is testifying. I don't, I don't think that this is a problem, and it is even less a problem because this article uh, was uh, accepted by the chamber. The President, the objection and grounds for objection by the prosecutor against the last question posed by the defense team for Mr. Kilson Pond is well grounded and uh, this question is not relevant to the facts, particularly to uh, it does not fall within the scope of the expert's expertise. So the uh, counsel is directed to move on, and the expert uh, needs not respond to the last question uh, posed by the counsel. That is a pity, but I will proceed. However, uh, in a document that was accepted by the chamber, E3271.2, this is an interview that you gave to the Phnom Penh Post on 7 March 2013, which um, happened when you came uh, to testify for the first time. And as you know, since Yung Sari was uh, not well, then uh, the hearing was not possible. And you say, the ERN in French is 00894870 and 00894302 English. And let me uh, quote an excerpt in which you mention Rwanda and you draw a parallel with the reconciliation process, and this is what you say. Uh, let me say again, the ER in, in English, 00893894302, and you say, in Rwanda, where the hatreds were deeper and much older than in the Khmer Rouge, because there were ethnic hatreds, they basically had a process of reconciliation. It worked. There was a form of trial through village communities, but everyone, not just a few symbolic fingers, everyone was made to undergo this process. And the result was you don't have what you have in Cambodia, where you have Kyusomba, Yingsari, and Nunchea at court, and everybody else, all the people who carried out the killings, are living next to the families of those they killed in the villages. 
Now I would like uh, to connect this excerpt of your interview with the video that was shown to you yesterday by the co-prosecutor and you said regarding this video that you felt it was necessary also to speak about uh, the responsibilities of the intellectuals but also of the cadres and of the people at the local level, at the district level, at the zone level. You said that it was necessary to speak about that, their responsibility. So am I right or am I wrong uh, to connect what you said in this article to what you said yesterday uh, regarding uh, the video that was shown to you uh, by uh, the co-prosecutor, the video of your conference. I don't remember in which university it was, but uh, is it basically in the same line of thought? The President, uh, Mr. Expert, please hold on. Mr. Prosecutor, you may proceed. Again, Your Honours, completely irrelevant, completely irrelevant to the issues before you. Comparative analyses of transitional justice mechanisms between Rwanda and Cambodia might be appropriate for a conference which my friend and I can attend together, but not for this trial. The question should not be allowed. She should be directed to move on. Well, I'm coming to the end of my uh, questions, but I wanted to finish in the same way as uh, the co-prosecutor ended yesterday. If the co-prosecutor was allowed to speak about a conference, uh, and I'm not speaking about a conference, I'm speaking about direct statements uh, in a newspaper, and I see that Philip Short is nodding, and I don't know why, because I am asking him questions on a general topic regarding the experts' conclusions on who to judge and what are the responsibilities at line uh, in uh, the functioning of democratic Kampuchea. I don't know why I sh should not be allowed to ask this kind of question, because I think this question is useful for the chamber, useful in order to understand the work of the expert and also useful because it raises an issue of responsibility and this is precisely what this trial is about. So I don't know why I should not be allowed to ask this question. So I uh, would like the chamber to authorize uh, the witness to answer this question and then I will be done. The President. The objection and grounds for objection by the prosecutor is appropriate. This question is not relevant. The expert is directed not to respond to the last question posed by counsel. Well, in that case, uh, I am done. Uh, Mr. Short, uh, thank you for having had the patience to answer my questions. Good afternoon, Mr. Philip Short. I am Kung Sumon. I am the National Defense Counsel for Mr. Kiu Sumpon. I only have a few questions just for um, a clarification on a few things that you have uh, testified over the last few days. My first uh, point, I would like to ask you for clarification on your statement uh, to the question uh, posed on the 6th of May at 9.51.58. Hour, when Judge Cartwright asked you concerning Mr. P. Pun, I would like to read out uh, this segment. You said uh, you refer to a document as a reference based on the uh, confession stored at the uh, DC CAM and the archive of the Documentation Center of Cambodia. And my recollection 
is that uh, there were two, three or four uh, references uh, concerning the meeting of the uh, permanent committee in 1973. And I also received uh, the information uh, from meeting with people concerning the uh, meeting of standing committee from 1973, 74, and 75 over the three-year period. So just a point of clarification. The meeting that people mentioned that it was a standing, uh, com uh, the central committee rather, that you uh, told the court on the 6th of May. Was it a meeting of the central committee or a standing committee? Just, just a point of clarification on this. I think there was some confusion uh, over that uh, exchange because uh, there, were, there was discussion of 73 and it should have been 74. This was the central committee meeting in which I in my book said was in September 1974. And, in fact, uh, one of the council uh, produced a, a Revolutionary Flags article uh, showing it was in June 74. Uh, Pi spoke of September. Clearly, it was in June, but it was 74, not 73. So far as I know, uh, I, I have no recollection of a Central Committee meeting in 73. There was in 72 and 74, but not, I think, in 73. Again, I would like to know whether or not uh, there was a confusion in the uh, statement of P. Poon concerning the meeting of a standing committee and a central committee. Was it a standing committee meeting or a central committee meeting? It was a central committee meeting. Thank you. Did you ask Mr. P. Poon when the uh, Central Committee was being held, uh, where was uh, Mr. P. Poon? He was present. Uh, it was in the village of Miak, and uh, he, was, he was there. He was not part of the discussion because he was not a Central Committee member. But as a as a bodyguard and an aide to Pol Pot, he was he was there when the meeting took place. Thank you. I believe uh, that you understand the nature of secrecy of the uh, Central Committee uh, of the Khmer Rouge uh, at that time. So did you ask uh, P. Poon how uh, he had derived the information about the Central Committee? Because in his capacity as a security guard or bodyguard, uh, he had to uh, be somewhere away from the meeting room. I, I was wondering how he could come to know what was going on in the meeting. The Jirai bodyguards were uh, the most trusted uh, of those around the central leadership. And they had uh, access which others even of higher rank did not have. Uh, I, I have no doubt that uh, Pipun was not only present um, at the place where the central committee met, um, but uh, he was able to get access to the information which was discussed there. Uh, the, these people were in a uniquely privileged and uniquely trusted position. Can you tell the uh, position of uh, Mr. P. Poon uh, in 1974? President, 
Uh, Mr. Expert, please hold on. Mr. Prosecutor, you may proceed. I should have objected earlier, but I do object now. This is a repetitive question. We've heard it asked and answered at least one, uh, twice so far. Uh, again, we're in extra time. Council have asked specifically for extra time because the experts' evidence is so expansive and vast and complex for them to manage. And now they're returning to the same issues that we've been hearing questions and answers about and asking the exact same questions again. I would like to respond to the objection by uh, the prosecutor. I believe that this question is not repetitive because um, the statement of the expert earlier on, uh, he uh, said that uh, Pi Poon uh, changed his position over time. So he was the messenger, bodyguard, an aide, and then the uh, security head. So I was not quite sure uh, with uh, uh, this statement. That's why I asked for a very specific clarification as to what uh, position he held uh, back in 1974. The President, the objection overruled. Uh, the expert is uh, directed to respond to the question by counsel. At that time, he was a bodyguard. Um, bodyguard, I, th I think, in Pi Poon's case, was perhaps not a sufficient description. Uh, it was a little bit closer to an aide-de-camp, uh, uh, to use a French term. That is, a bodyguard who uh, was, uh, had a, a slightly more general role as a helper for uh, the secretary, for, for Pol Pot. Thank you. You also, uh, you, uh, I would like to know whether or not you ask people concerning the numbers of uh, participants of that particular meeting. Yes. Um, I think I, I give a, an indication of who was present in my book, and that would certainly have come at least in part from him. Thank you. I would like to now turn to a different point. Your, uh, in your uh, testimony on the government institution, uh, subordinate to the Democratic Cambodia government at that time, uh, you told the court that those uh, institutions were powerless, they were symbolic also. So, was it fair uh, to summarize from what you say that all the ministry uh, were powerless at the time, or there were certain ministries who were actually powerful and others were just not that powerful also? There were ministries that had power. I think we have to distinguish between the, the, the period before 75 when the ministries were non-existent, they were purely names uh, which related to no real institutions. And after 1975, and particularly after 1976, when the ministries were created as, as real uh, working organisms, uh, the defense ministry and uh, the foreign ministry being by far the most important, uh, the social affairs ministry apparently was, I say apparently, uh, according to the sources I've been able to consult, under Ying Tirit was uh, substantial. It had a number of workers. But none of these uh, were policy-making organs. Uh, policy was made by the party. And unlike in other systems where ministers attended regular cabinet me meetings, that simply did not happen. Uh, there, were, there was no system of regular cabinet meetings. Thank you. 
You also told the court about the role of Mr. Kilsom Pon, which was the president of State Presidium. Looking at the uh, office Mr. Kilsom Pon held at that time, uh, what was the operating authority of this particular office? You are referring to his role as head of state? I am. I would like you to enlighten the court on the um, the uh, reality of the power that Mr. Kilsampon held uh, in his uh, capacity as the president of the state uh, presidium uh, during the Democratic Cambodia. To use the term uh, figurehead is perhaps uh, too, too much a shorthand, but the president, uh, the head of state of Democratic Kampuchea, had no power other than that which uh, the party chose to, to delegate to him. Uh, it, uh, like, the, like the government, so the head of state had no autonomous power of his own, all power was held by the party. So if you're saying, did Mr. Kusompon as head of state have any decision-making power, uh, the answer surely is no. Thank you. On the 7th of May, at uh, 15, 07.56, when you were asked by the prosecutor concerning the um, withdrawal of Mr. Kiu Sampon from uh, any uh, decision-making uh, bodies, you told the court that Mr. Kilson Pond had never withdrawn himself from any decision-making uh, uh, moment. Do you still recall saying that uh, during your testimony earlier? I'm sorry, I'm not quite following the question. Withdrawn himself from any decision-making body? I, I, perhaps the, the translation is problematic. Well, I would like to read uh, this uh, record of uh, transcript again at hour 15.07.56. The question asked by the prosecutor. I have a question concerning Mr. Kilson Pond, according to your research. Did you uh, encounter any evidence that Mr. Kilson Pond had any dissenting opinion or disagreement so that he excused himself from any decision? Uh, and in your answer, you said no, no. And you went on. I knew that he never disagreed uh, with anyone and he never excused himself from any the decision uh, any decision and uh, he had uh, a relation with others do you recall this so i would like to uh, expand on this issue did you know any matters uh, that Mr. Kilson Pond was involved in uh, decision making with any state organs or uh, the decision uh, by his own discretion. Uh, that depends on uh, how you use the word involved. Uh, as we have seen, he was present at standing committee meetings uh, he was a member, I would think important, others would say less, of the general office, which was the transmission belt for those decisions. Uh, he, he was party to those decisions. Even if they were not made by him, 
He never objected, which I agree would have been very difficult to do because he would have put himself at risk. But he didn't object. He embraced uh, all the decisions which were made by uh, the DK authorities, by the CPK. In that sense, he was party to them, and he never dissented from them. Council, may I seek uh, further clarification on this? Is it fair to say that you do not have any specific documents to prove that uh, Mr. Kilsompon involved in decision making on any policy during that time? Is it fair to say that? There are many documents to prove that he was party to the decisions made. Uh, I am not aware of any documents which show that he played a decisive part in elaborating those decisions or the policies. Um, I, I think this is slightly a semantic problem. Uh, if you are party to a decision, that in itself means you are you are in agreement with it, uh, that you uh, accept uh, the, the, the policy line which emerges, whether or not you personally have contributed to the making of that decision. Council, someone, I thank you. I am mindful of the time. I would like now to move to Document E3-232, uh, uh, and with Mr. President's uh, leave, I would like the document to be handed over to the witness. The President, uh, indeed, uh, you may proceed, and Court Officer is now directed to bring the document to the witness for examination. Mr. Witness, uh, this document has been discussed at length already, but I have a few questions uh, to discuss on this. The topic of this document is uh, the minutes of the meeting on the 8th of March uh, 1976. There were two items, one about the election and also the situation in the North 106 and 103. I would like you to go through the document uh, with me regarding the report uh, by Comrade Ham. You said uh, Ham was killed some pawn. And in this document, uh, you see the five dashes, and they were about the policies regarding the election of 1976 and the methods of voting and also the other, uh, the other criteria regarding um, how people can stand for such election and also uh, method in the a propaganda process. And uh, my question to you is, how can you prove that uh, these matters uh, or in this report was part of Kil Sampan's report or writing? How could you be so sure on this? Uh, are you asking how you can be sure that Comrade Hem was in fact Q Sompon? Or uh, how can you be sure that this minute is a reflection of what happened at the meeting? Response. Uh, that not uh, my question, and I indeed. Uh, uh, recognize that uh, you testify that Kilsom Pon and Ham were the same person. But I would like uh, to ask you about the content of the report uh, 
uh, that uh, written by Ham in these five points. I was, talk, I was talking about the election on the 23rd of March uh, 1976. So what kind of principle was, uh, were reported uh, by Kyusampon? Did you conduct further research uh, to have these content cross-checked? Cross-checking, as we discussed earlier, is very important when it is possible. If there are no sources to cross-check with, then one has to rely on the only sources which exist. Uh, we do know that Q. Sampan was responsible for elections because there are other documents which speak of that. Uh, we know that the elections took place because there are broadcasts by Radio Phnom Penh about them. The, uh, it is, would be natural that Q. Sompon would be responsible because he was responsible for relations with, uh, with Sihanouk, for United Front work. Um, the elections themselves were part of, of, I can only describe them, as part of a facade of respectability which the DK regime uh, created uh, for the outside world to think that it had uh, the ordinary institutions common to every state. Uh, significantly, the, the parliament only met, as we've discussed, once. Council, thank you for this clarification. I would like you to also move to the second point, which is about the further opinions and expectations of Hong Kong. Can you please explain to the chamber who Hong Kong would refer to here? The CPK the organization, which was another uh, reference, another way of speaking of the CPK. Council, thank you. You indicated that it's the CPK that refers to Anka, but here, do you believe that it is an individual was talking here rather than the party itself? The President, uh, Mr. Expert, could you please hold on and international court prosecutor, you may proceed. The question is repetitive, it is leading. Uh, the, he asked the question, he got an answer, he didn't like it, so he puts words in the expert's uh, mouth. This should not be allowed. We object. Council, this question was not leading. I am citing from the document uh, which reads that further opinions and explanations of Anka, and it is unequivocal uh, that uh, Anka was mentioned here, and since the expert is right before us, it would be best for him to shed light on this. President, the objection is appropriate and sustained. Mr. Short uh, uh, is now instructed not to respond uh, to the question. And councils, uh, your times uh, have already been used. Uh, Council Kung uh, on Mr. President, may I please ask for just two or three more minutes? Uh, the President, uh, how much time you would need, but we will uh, grant you just three minutes, perhaps one more question 
and we will conclude the session today. Council on thank you, Mr. President, indeed for this. Mr. Short, uh, please um, look at the content of this document again. Again, point number two, further opinions and explanations of ONCA. And there are subsections, section A, B, C, and D. Had you reviewed or examined this uh, content of the document before? Yes, I have. Council, thank you. Can you also tell the chamber your understanding of the content in these four sub points? Well, very briefly, because time is pressing, um, uh, he says, uh, he, uh, in this case certainly being Pol Pot, who is speaking, the secretary uh, of ANCA, that the world is waiting and watching us. Therefore, this is, this is something necessary to show the world that, as he put it, puts it, we are not wild and disorderly. And he also says later on, uh, don't let them see that we're deceptive and our assembly is worthless, uh, which is uh, singularly truthful. Um, the, the whole purpose of this assembly was to impress the outside world with the seriousness of the DK state. Council, thank you. I would like uh, you to also look at uh, the part concerning the report to the base by Comrade Ham and the explanation of further opinions uh, by Anka. And can you explain this uh, to the chamber? Your understanding of this. We are, we are talking about um, uh, the existence of spies on the Thai border. Is that the section you're referring to? Um, I don't draw any particular uh, conclusions. Uh, the, the report speaks of, uh, Comrade Hung is, is reporting in terms of the agricultural situation in his, his region, and then the relations with Thailand. He mentioned uh, some Council uh, Kung Som On. I apologize uh, for interrupting. But uh, I would like you to compare the five points. As I uh, indicated, uh, and also the point and the point number two from A to D, could you compare the content of these two portions? The two portions of the report, the, the well, the, the first section is entirely devoted to the elections, and the next section uh, is devoted to uh, problems of various kinds in, in the provinces, in, in, in the regions. Um, and I think that is, again, normal enough. Uh, a standing committee meeting would discuss various subjects, and uh, it did. <laughs> it went it went on to discuss even foreign policy. Um, so 
I, I'm, I'm not understanding quite what you're trying to get at, so I apologize. What do you want but, me to comment on? But. Council, thank you. I believe that uh, perhaps uh, my message uh, was not properly conveyed. I already asked you a few questions regarding point number one, which uh, is about the report by Comrade Ham, and there were sub five subsections. And second point here is regarding the further opinions uh, by Anka. And as you see, Ham um, report comprised of five sub points and very brief. But when you have it compared with the opinions, uh, further opinions by Anka, you can see uh, it was rather lengthy and more uh, substantive more specific than the report uh, made by Comrade Ham, which uh, were rather broad and they were more like the headings of items to be discussed uh, regarding election. There, it lacked specificity in uh, such a matter. That's why we would like you to make comparison between these two um, te uh, portions. N now I understand, and I do apologize for not having been uh, quicker to see it. Um, I, I think this is the nature of minute-taking, especially at the standing committee meetings. Uh, there are five broad headings for Comrade Hem, what he reported on. He may well have reported for 20 minutes uh, or half an hour, I don't know. Um, but he certainly would have given a, a fairly detailed report on these four, five items. But to the minute taker, what was important was uh, Pol Pot's comments. That is why they are in much greater detail, because uh, Pol Pot's comments are in the nature of instructions, guidelines for how the elections are to be carried out. Uh, so surely Pol Pot was more important than Comrade Hem. And warranted much more space. The President, um, thank you, Council, and thank you, Mr. Short. Your testimony now is complete, and you are now excused. The court is very grateful indeed to, to your attendance. It has been four days already, and we note how very difficult this has been for you as you had been bombarded with questions. But the chamber trusts that your testimony helps ascertain the truth. At the same time, once again, the Chamber wishes to thank you very much, and uh, we wish you all the very best, and in particular, safe travels home. Court officer is now directed to assist uh, with the vessel unit to ensure that Mr. Philip Short is returned to his place safe and sound. Today, hearing now comes to an end. The chamber will adjourn now, and the next sessions will be resumed on Monday, the 20th of May at 9 a.m. On Monday, the chamber will be hearing TCW 253 questions to be put by the co prosecutors before the uh, the parties to the proceeding. Co-prosecutors will have half day for putting question to uh, this along with the legal lawyers for the civil parties and the defense counsel will have both a half day uh, for this questioning time. Security personnel are now directed to bring Mr. Kyosong Pon and Noon Jie back to the detention facility and have them return to the courtroom by 20th of May 2013.
when Mr. Nunjie is directed the order to be transferred only to the holding cell where he can observe the proceedings from there through audio visual link, the court is adjourned.